So it's been a very long time since I last reviewed a vampire film. So let's take a look at Francis Ford Coppola's take on the tale of undying love with Bram Stoker's Dracula. In 1462, Vlad Dracula led a war against the Turks in the name of God, only to return home to find his wife Elizabeth dead. With his enemies making her believe Vlad had been slain, she took her own life, which condemns her soul in the eyes of God. Thus Vlad renounces God and all that he stands for, and vows to rise from the grave to avenge her with all the powers of darkness. Four centuries later, the young Jonathan Harker leaves his bride-to-be Mina on a professional errand to arrange a real estate acquisition for the Transylvanian Count Dracula. Yet when the Count sees a photo of Jonathan's bride, he believes it to be the reincarnation of his beloved Elisabetta. Harker fears for his soul as strange and haunting occurrences are abound, especially when trapped by the Count's vampire brides, who begin to feed on him regularly. Once Dracula travels by ship to England to his newly acquired estate at Carfax Abbey, he attacks and transforms Mina's friend Lucy, leaving her in a very ill state. Dr. Jack Seward thus calls upon his mentor, Professor Abraham Van Helsing, an expert in exotic diseases and medicines, in order to help treat her. Yet meanwhile, Mina encounters the elegant and hypnotic Prince Vlad, who charms her with his sophistication, uniquely enchanting passion. However, he desires only to take back the love that was stolen from him centuries ago. Professor Van Helsing quickly determines the truth of the situation and knows the source of this vampirism must be destroyed at all costs. As Dracula's hold on Mina grows, they attempt to use her connection with him to track the Count back to his Transylvania stronghold, but they may have no hope to end this conflict between unholy evil and a love that will not die. So Bram Stoker's Dracula, produced and directed by Francis Ford Coppola, hit cinemas on November 13th, 1992, grossing over $215 million of a $40 million budget, giving Coppola a very well-needed hit after he had some financial hardships at the time, and was very relieved to see the box office takes rolling in on the film. But so much of the origin of the film comes in a very kind of serendipitous type of way where... As for Coppola had been a fan, very endearing type of fan of the novel for many, many years back, and through his relationship with, with Noda Ryder, got the script from James V. Hart passed on to him, and very much was impressed and very much kind of fell in love with what Hart was doing with the script and adapting it from Stoker's original novel, which has a very unusual type of structure to it. A lot of it is kind of this almost dossier of certain events that go down through diaries and mailings and letters and journals and various documents sort of pieced together to create an overall linear structure of a story in sort of an unconventional fashion. So finding a way to take that text and adapt it into a much more of a easily digestible sort of screenplay and film adaptation takes a certain amount of skill and there's been countless Dracula adaptations for many, 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 many decades with a lot of them not being as terribly close to the source material as Coppola kind of really wanted going into this project and everything, seeing a lot of things that just kind of weren't terribly much in line with Stoker's original spirit of what came from that imagination. But getting all that stuff from James V. Hart, who took a lot of this stuff and did make his own sort of adjustments to the lore and the sort of backbone of the story here, making the character of Dracula very much sort of this tragic figure in the whole thing where this character has more of a backstory of this sort of reincarnated love that he had and all these different things that kind of make him this soldier and warrior who ends up forsaking God after being a warrior for him 
taking out all these people who are very much against that religion. All these wars are going on to defend the honor of God and his religion, all that type of stuff, and trying to reconcile and deal with this whole thing of his beloved taking her own life and all these different things to feel like he's been betrayed and neglected and all these different things to have that sort of thing weave through the entire narrative here to create much more of a strength in the romance quality of what this story can bring to the forefront of it this dug it further deeper into the the mythos the, the deep-seated motivations of dracula over, overall it's a very interesting thing how they just take different things into account from the source material and try to weave it into a slightly different type of package that streamlines things and deepens certain meanings of everything it's a very intriguing type of way of how Hart took the entire text and transplanted it into this wonderful narrative that Coppola so dearly put his heart and soul and everything into it to create an overall wonderful package of this film that comes together in such a wonderfully lush and grandiose type of fashion to create a, a horror epic of sorts that had such a, a throwback quality to it in a certain way because the novel came out right at the end of the 19th century, about 1897, and Coppola kind of looked back and saw sort of like this was the sort of birth of motion pictures and everything and a certain sense of magicianship and trickery and all these different types of things. And we wanted to capture a certain sense about that time period, that sort of quality, that artistry. You could tap into the period itself and have the filmmaking styles reflect that in so many different fashions, from the special effects to the costumes to the direction of the film in general. Just like so much of what he does is so much craftsmanship and so much care to every little quality of how he wants to weave together this beautiful tapestry of the film. It created such a magnificently looking and breathing type of film here that creates such a beautifully elegant weaving of terror and romance to this whole thing that such of what he does here and just his stylistic choices with the film because a lot of the things you want to go with with this film is make a lot of the costumes stand out so much that he didn't want to have overly elaborate sets. He wanted to have a certain almost sort of operatic quality to certain things that have these wide open beautiful backdrops that don't draw attention to themselves too much so much so that the original production designer he had in the film we went completely against Coppola's witches and tried to design all these extremely elaborate sets that would have cost a whole ton more money than what the film was budgeted out for and Coppola had to kick him to the curb as well as some of the original visual effects people who really wanted to go and do things in a much more modernistic type of way just like standard conventional type of stuff instead of trying to be more imaginative trying to understand where Coppola is coming from with his artistry and his creative drive towards the film his overall vision for it and so what he really created here was something that takes a lot of centerpieces of the characters and the costumes and that type of design here especially when you have anyone in like a red robe or a gown or whatnot really strikes out so strongly on screen here with all these sort of more muted earth tone type of stuff going on it has such a great quality to to have this sort of reflection or symbolism of blood but also maybe a sense of passion as well here because that's so much of a integral type of thing to the whole film the blood but also the passion the heart of things the love and everything that's sort of the the, the crux of the story here that he does such a great job to just pick these little things that have them stand out against these backdrops and everything all these interesting sort of locations that they have where absolutely everything was shot on a soundstage in california and it's amazing what he does with all that type of stuff to utilize that quality to create a unique feel for the film in general here because just everything they do with just having the film have a certain sense of a classicness to it that it harkens back to all those sort of universal classic horror movies but still has its own style a certain timelessness to it every single stylistic and artistic choice that coppola makes paints the film with such a beautiful brush across every single frame of this film and so much of that is due to the wonderful work of the now late cinematographer michael ballhouse who passed away in 2017 and was a regular collaborator with martin scorsese 
he does a phenomenal piece of work filming this movie because the atmosphere and the mood that he creates with all the light and the shadow and all these fascinating sort of tricks that he creates with the special effects of the film all these things come off such a beautiful type of way that just enchants you and raptures you into the the fiber and the beauty and just the gothic nature of the film just draws you in so much of what he just paints across every single frame in this movie there's such an ominous beauty for the film such a great sense of how to capture certain imagery here that just strikes out so strongly everything you puts together just splashes of light here or there or just everything just creates such a, a consistent feel to it and just like again the timeless quality and just a, just a unique sense of things with shooting everything on the sound stages all the type of stuff creates such a wonderful type of quality overall in the film that i just think aids it to make it such an enduring classic that's become and just the cinematography overall just creates such a great sense of just the terror and the romantic quality that the film weaves in together with such a tragic sense about things it's a beautifully woven package in every sense of the word and every artistic quality that comes off on screen in this movie and you got a very good cast in this film you got a fantastic cast for the most part starting out with gary oldman here who is just a phenomenal actor that this is right in the core of when he would just just bursting onto just the, the critical scene of everything, having done like Sid and Nancy and later do stuff like Leon the Professional and so many other wonderful, just dynamic, versatile roles. This guy was just like nailing things left, right, and center throughout this time period of his career and everything. Just like it was an amazing piece of thing to just see how Gary Oldman was working things at this point in time and getting this type of role where it was kind of going up against some other from Coppola's own words whatnot, going out with some very major stars at the time and whatnot, he was absolutely the right choice because he was such, a, again, a versatile actor to take on all the different qualities and the different facades of this character and everything from, you've got the elderly count in the whole film where he's got all that heavy makeup on him and this sort of just creepy quality to everything he's doing just almost a subversive nature of what he's doing and all these scenes opposite Jonathan Harker but portrayed by Keanu Reeves all these different things just create such such a, a atmosphere just from his performance alone just, if you were in the presence of this character here and everything you just you just feel like stuff was crawling all over your skin and up your spine it just has that quality just like creepy as living hell what he's doing here just this sort of a lustful ecstasy of being just embracing his nocturnal nature, the sort of delight that he has in these moments of just like indulging in just the, the bloodlust and all these different things, feeding his brides, the, this baby and everything. It's like these terrible, terrifying moments and just seeing just how he just absolutely relishes these moments or whatnot. It's such an immersive type of performance just in that regard. But you also see the young prince, Vlad, you know, that he portrays, where he goes after Mina Harker and all these different things going on. You see the, the gentlemanly quality, sophistication he can project out on the screen and everything. All these different qualities that he's sort of romancing her and all these beautiful type of ways that he's just weaving that type of thing onto the screen and into her heart and all these different qualities that just like... It, it's just a, a wonderful, fantastic performance he puts together with these different things that do add up to the same character. They all connect overall to have these different facets of his different forms and all these different things to have this lovelorn quality, this tragic sense about this character who is just pained and tortured so much. The love that he's so impassionate about, so so driven towards recapturing, but is it, so feels like it's so out of reach in a certain way that he's not willing to really condemn her and so it's like this conflict that he plays in the whole film and just like having all these sort of weeks in production where he wasn't filming yet but he was kind of working with the special effects guys and various other people and whatnot to kind of craft the entire performance or whatnot came on the set with like a ton of extra ideas and different sort of 
versions of the character that tr portray on screen. It created such an amazing performance here that creates just a tapestry of this character. You never really saw this much of a, a, a mosaic of Dracula on screen before just seeing so much of a, a wide berth of what you could do with this character from that text and just expand the ideas, expand the quality of it and the mythos in general, just like Gary Oldman's top of the book on Dracula portrayals is a fantastic actor and this is just like a tour de force type of thing from the screenplay up through the actor himself. Again, Winona Ryder into the film as Mina Harker because obviously she passed the script on and there was kind of a, a thing where she ended up having to bow out of Godfather Part 3 and kind of owed Coppola something down the line or whatnot. And I do find that it is a fine performance. I think there's a few things in it that I like. But I do find the character of Mina in this whole thing is a little bit sort of lacking in depth. I don't think there's so much that really defines the character of Mina in this film as her own independent type of character. I think she's much more of a a reflection, sort of this character who's just this object in the film that people are Dracula's lusting over and have this sort of connection with and all this type of stuff. I don't think there's as much depth to the character as I think you possibly could have done, or I think there are a few other adaptations that have done a little bit more with that sort of approach and that sort of intention with the character there. I just think it is a little bit underwritten in a certain way that I don't think is really her fault. But I've, I've heard some people feel like there's some moments in the film that they feel a little bit overwrought. Her performance gets a little bit over the top in a certain way, but there's a few things where she gets a little bit more theatrical near the end of the film that I feel like they were enjoyable for me. I kind of like that type of stuff because the whole film is getting a little bit more overly dramatic in certain ways. It, you know, you're building up a lot of drama, a lot more uh, climactic energy in the film. I think they kind of aided towards things to have her a lot more strained and torn or whatnot. And she's being sort of just drawn so deeply into Dracula's sway and everything that she starts seducing Van Helsing and going off in these different things. I felt like that worked. I think she portrayed those moments well. But in general, I just don't think there was much to really kind of comment on with her character in general here. So that's about all I have to say about her. But uh, I do love Keanu Reeves. The guy's a wonderful actor when you get him right in his zone. When I've seen him in like Bill and Ted, Point Break, Speed, Matrix, Constantine, even Devil's Advocate. I think he's a really good actor in that film too. And obviously the John Wick films don't have to say much there or whatnot. But uh Apparently, they originally were casting Johnny Depp in this role until like the last minute when Columbia Pictures kind of felt like Johnny wasn't a big enough marketable star to put in the film despite after coming off of a hit television series with 21 Jump Street and I think he'd just done Edward Scissorhands, but wherever they felt, it didn't feel like he was big enough star at the time, so they forced them to switch out for Keanu Reeves, so pretty much this is like last minute type of switch of casting, so... Keanu didn't have a lot of time to prepare for the role, but I do feel like he is the weakest link in the entire cast of the movie because just doesn't quite come off as a very believable type of British accent. I just think he comes off very flat and just out of place in general that, when you, again, when you get him in his zone to do the right type of work that he really kind of excels at, he's fantastic, but I just felt like this was just not in his comfort zone of delivering what he's strongest at delivering. So him as Jonathan Harker really is the sort of thing that just doesn't quite hit up the standards of the rest of the film that's going after. But you got a lot of other really good things like you got Richard E. Grant, you've got Carrie Elwes, you've got Billy Campbell, you got a really good solid supporting cast for this whole film. Tom Waits just doing a fantastic, just wild off the wall, just completely batshit crazy Renfield in this film. Just like absolute delight to see him doing that. But of course, you've got Anthony Hopkins here as Professor Abraham Van Helsing. And just like, I just wait for him to show up in the film because I absolutely love everything he does in this film. Anthony Hopkins does a fantastic job here. Just when he comes to the film, you get this sort of strong theatrical presence that he just naturally kind of brings with him, carries with him and pretty much any role he takes on or whatnot. But the commanding authority that you have with Van Helsing, it just is this confidence all this character just like sort of laser focused type of quality with what he how he approaches things how he 
deals with certain situations. Just like he's a guy who's like very clear cut and decisive of knowing what's going on, taking action, and not really having much of a, a social grace about certain things, which kind of creates a, a sort of eccentric personality for the character in a certain way that he has these sort of sort of deadpan casual remarks of the film with these sort of gruesome ideas and whatnot that just burst me out laughing at certain points because it just, it's just so casual of what he kind of conveys to certain other characters who think either it's very inappropriate at a certain point or just like it's just very just out there and outlandish gruesome stuff about cutting out hearts and chopping people's heads off or whatnot. It's a really interesting thing and Hopkins was a little bit sort of reserved and maybe going over the top with the character but Coppola kind of really wanted that type of thing to have a little bit more of a, a verbose quality to the character of Van Helsing here and I think that really helps the film a lot to kind of just shake things up a little bit. You get some, someone in there in the cast and in the characters and whatnot to really kind of just make something a little less conventional and everything and just a little less dry. You got someone there with a lot of charisma and someone who can really just kind of push things a little bit in different directions and kind of wrangle things around a little bit. It just like creates a more entertaining, interesting character that still has a sharp intellect and a very clever way of sort of unraveling a situation and sort of deconstructing the sort of motives of Dracula and all these types of things and delving into the, the lore and the mythos, all these types of stuff. I think it's a wonderful performance. I think what how they write the character Van Helsing here really creates a, a really needed cog in the storyline to create a very compelling sort of protagonist here that just kind of just propels you down the narrative and everything and created some entertainment value and just charismatic quality just like I love what Hopkins did to create this and really trying to adopt that type of style that Coppola was really kind of wanting to get out of the character there so it's a wonderful cast in general with only kind of kind of being a little weak in what he can portray in this film but everyone else just delivers in spades all over this place just like I loved every single thing everyone was doing here they did a fantastic job and Coppola directed everyone so very well to just hone everything in the right directions and get everything that it really needed from the actors. And the film score from Polish composer Wojciech Kyler just creates a beautifully haunting atmosphere overall with all the, the terror, the tension, all these things building up in the film to such a operatic level, but also being able to take it down to these sort of simple, sorrowful strings to just reflect the love, lore, and tragic quality that the film has underlined throughout the whole thing. It creates a beautifully emotional and just thrilling quality of the entire film that matches up so perfectly with Coppola and his intentions and his vision for the film overall. It's a magnificent piece of work as well and something extremely incredible with this film are all the effects work that was put together here first with the creature effects and the makeup effects which is put together by Greg Canham who had worked on The Howling, The Lost Boys, Exorcist 3, Star Trek 6, all these wonderful really just fantastic pieces of work throughout the years and just so many more things before this, fantastically after this, worked on the Pirates of the Caribbean films and so many other wonderful type of things that are just creating amazing effects for his entire career his a fantastic milestone with everything he does here, creating all these creatures, all this stuff in the film. Just It just explodes with such a massive sort of quality and skill and attention to detail with having just... Just when you see the big creatures of the film, when Gary Oldman, Dracula, turns into the giant bat, it's just fantastically terrifying type of stuff that just it's towering, seven foot tall. It's just fantastic work just transforming that in a way where the performance still shows through so very well that you can see the, the sorrow, the, the pain in the eyes of Gary Oldman and creates a character but also allows the, the soul of it all to come through and everything, the heart of what Oldman is putting into this to come through so beautifully and the much more simpler sort of subtle type of things throughout the entire film when you have like Lucy or whatnot come back from the dead and all this type of stuff just like it's ghastly it's grisly type of stuff so it's like the film has that romantic edge to it but when it comes down to the horror it comes down to the more terrifying type of stuff it really just embraces it so much it has an equal balance of these things 
so much the credit of everything that Coppola just crafts for the film, but the makeup work in the film is incredibly well done and just like, just fantastic. Just like you can't possibly top this type of work. It's absolutely exceptional type of stuff. And with the special effects of the film, as I kind of alluded to earlier that Coppola wanted to achieve as much in camera as possible in this film. And like I said, original visual effects supervisors got kicked out the door because it just would not be imaginative towards what Coppola wanted. They just wanted to do things in the same old simple way. He wanted to do things in much more of a, a overall immersive type of fashion stylistically. And so brought his son Roman Coppola in the film who did all the special effects for the film, supervised all that type of stuff. And it's like so much of this, there's a few optical composites in the film where things are absolutely positively needed to create that effect. But even some stuff that you would normally think were like an optical composite of the eyes of Dracula across the sky or whatnot, or various other things like you've got that foreground book and then the tray in the background, that was all done in shot. It was all done in camera within a large book of that journal and a model train and whatnot in the background with a forced perspective all the stuff was just created so well with masking off different things with mats or whatnot to multiple exposures for the film to create these different aspects of everything there to create all these fascinating type of things just like it's an amazing piece of work what was achieved here with all the effects work everything across the board even the few visual effects that were created from fantasy 2 or worked with james cameron on the terminator films before this you've got all the top stuff here all these fantastically imaginative ambitious type of people involved in this film to achieve francis ford coppola's vision and the way he wanted to achieve it is this fantastic exercise in creating old school effects with a modern polish that everything works so very well create imaginative ways to create these illusions and do it even cheaper than you could with all the composite stuff, the optical and or maybe digital composites that were coming into fruition at the time. It took this old school approach to old trickery, magic tricks, all this type of stuff that were done at that time, the book was published and just created an overall quality that just, again, aids the stylistic quality of the film so much with the just the timelessness again like i said it just feels like this film just not does not date in any type of way that if you use too many digital effects in this thing certainly at that time there were films that were using digital effects that didn't have the budget for it and they look very very dated now but coppola had that much of a forethought towards things and so much of a reflection on the source material he was working with to take that approach and want to create that style of film here that holds up magnificently after over 25 years still looks phenomenally good in every sense of the word there and just a few optical composites still work very very well because they still had the money left over to do them extremely well everything that's done here is on an impeccable level no doubt why these end up getting nominations at different award shows and a couple of wins here and there where unfortunately it only really got a technical award nominations and recognitions and whatnot so no acting awards for like Gary Oldman who would be completely overlooked for the bulk of his career up until pretty recently or whatnot it's kind of a crime in that way but the fact of the matter is that I've said before that awards don't really dictate the quality of the film or legacy of the film that's determined by the fans of the film and film lovers and cinema goers who remember these films and love these films and look back on them and keep their legacies alive. That's what matters, what its influence is and what it says about itself over the course of time. That's what matters more than a gold statue in my book any day of the week. But so much of what this film just crafts for itself is such an amazing piece of work that is kind of telling in a certain way that since this film hit, We've had a couple Dracula films like a Dracula 2000 or Dracula Untold, which admittedly aren't very good films, but you haven't had this quality, this level of a Dracula film even attempted by anyone since this film was made. No one's tried to go back to that source material and create a lavish production like this with such a, a, a big name director attached to it done, the Godfather trilogy, the conversation 
Apocalypse Now, all these fantastic films. They already had a tribute to him over a decade prior to this thing, decades before this, still coming into this thing, creating a fantastic film that stands the tests of time and still delivers terrifying moments, creepy, atmospheric type of stuff, and wraps it up with such a, such a gothic romance that has an elegance and a richness to it that everything comes off so beautifully well because Coppola had that vision, had people behind him who knew how to do what he wanted or behind what his vision was and endorsed him going forward to make this film so much that everything he had at his disposal would just use to absolute fantastic effect and create an amazing piece of work here that again, box office spoke very well of it, critics spoke very well of it, and time has spoke extremely well for it, and Coppola hit a classic here that endures to this day. So guys, what your thoughts are on this version of Dracula is very much important to be put down in the comments below, because everyone has their own favorite Dracula. I mean, my this isn't even my favorite Dracula. My favorite Dracula is from Monster Squad. I love Dick Duncan Rhaegar's performance as Dracula in that film, but can't deny the quality of what Gary Oldman brought to this role and did everything just such a rich type of fashion here. So, whatever your thoughts, what your feelings are, what is your favorite Dracula is, throw it down in the comments and let me know so we can kind of discuss the film a little bit more in there. So, thanks so much, guys, and uh, I hope to get a few more things out for Forever Hormones. Getting a little tight down to the wire. I've had a few little delays getting things out, but I'm glad to have gotten this taken care of and out to you guys because I had this Blu-ray sitting around for like two and a half years back when I did like the Fright Night and Lost Boys reviews. Nice to finally get around to it and make use of that damn poster behind me, finally. So, thanks much guys. Take care. Bye-bye.